and then start webinar. Good evening, everyone. My name is Roxanne Truen. I'm with the Michigan State University Science Festival. And tonight we have a really engaging topic for you on, um, no, I just lost my train of thought. On, oh, hang on. On the collaborative listener, exploring our connection with music through writing and drawing. And I'm pleased to welcome James Brinkman, who's going to take us through his talk. And I think, I believe there's some hands on activities you'll get to do along with him. Throughout the talk, if you have any questions, if you're watching on Zoom webinar, you can type them into the Q&A. And if you're listening on Facebook Live, you can add them in the comments section and we'll answer your questions at the end of the presentation. So now I'd like to turn it over to James Brinkman. Welcome. Great, thank you, Roxanne. It's great to be here. Thank you all for her. Thank you all um, who are joining me for this. Um, I'm really excited to um, share some of this work with you and do some activities. Um, as you're coming in, if you can just quickly okay. grab a piece of paper or some writing or coloring supplies that are near you. Um, if you don't have any near you, don't worry. We'll have a little bit of time. You can do that later. Um, for now, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and then we'll get into the presentation. So again, welcome to collaborative the Collaborative Listener, exploring our connection with music through writing and drawing. Um, I'm, a, I'm working on my doctorate in flute performance and a master's in musicology right now through the College of Music at MSU. And my research focuses on understanding how do people connect with music when listening? Um, so a little bit about where my research interest came from. Before coming to MSU for graduate school, I lived in Chicago for nine years, where I performed in two local orchestras and I freelanced. Um, while I loved playing and still do, I began noticing this disconnect with people who came to my concerts. Afterwards, they would often say, the music was so beautiful and inspiring. And I'd say, thank you. What did you find beautiful about it? And I was often responded to with silence, ums, or they said they just didn't know how to express it. And so in 2014, I began creating interactive performances to guide people to become more aware of their connection with music and be able to express it to someone else. And these interactive performances included writing and drawing, puzzles, movement, painting, conversation, and storytelling activities. I actually ended up leaving my orchestra jobs to solely focus on understanding how we connect and experience music as listeners. And that's the research that I continue doing today. So today I'm gonna to take you through my elevating art study, which I did on the, in the subway train stations in Chicago. And we're gonna do a little bit of experiment of the subway experience a little later on. And then we'll have some time to reflect on our listening experiences, as well as have time for any questions or comments at the end. So welcome to the elevating art experiment. On a cold gray winter day in Chicago, I descend into the cement tunnel of a subway station known locally as the L. I'm wearing jeans and a sweater and carrying my flute, two music stands and a bag with music posters and markers. And while I set up by one of these columns, I'm surrounded by busy sounds of people getting to their next destination. I begin to play a flute solo as people get on and off trains and some people pass my handmade sign that says, what do you hear in the music? Write, draw, or color. When my piece is over, I start it all over again as there's a new group of people from the new trains that have arrived. Hundreds of people are passing by and some are noticing what I'm doing. And over the span of an hour, 28 strangers express their reactions on the poster. Their expressions range from, you sound like a fairy to colorfully drawn trees, squiggles, and smiley faces. After an hour, I finish, pack, finish playing my flute, I pack up, and I leave the station. Elevating art began with two curiosities. 
what if a subway musician offers more than just entertainment for a dollar, but an opportunity for connection between a train passenger and performer? And how will people express their experience with Western classical music if it was spontaneous in public and it included an interactive element? I did this whole experiment in 2017 in the Red Line subway stations in downtown Chicago. And you can see my sign, which read, what do you hear in the music? Draw, write, or color. I provided markers and a blank poster as seen in the photo for people to use. I did this on four days, depending on when the station didn't have a musician already there. And each day I played one piece for 60 to 90 minutes over and over. And the pieces came from the Baroque, Classical, Romantic and early 20th century French eras. And out of hundreds of passengers over the four days, 70 anonymous people volunteered to add their expressions to one of the four posters. There were dozens of other people who spoke with me about their experiences, but they didn't add to the posters. And I didn't tell people the composer's name or the title of the piece because I didn't want that to influence someone's experience of the music. So now I'm gonna invite you to imagine and experience some of what the train passengers did. The two pieces you're about to hear were recorded in a parking garage here in East Lansing, Michigan. And since we don't have a subway system, I recorded in a place that had similar acoustics and environmental sounds. This includes wind interfer interference on the recording. And when you hear it, just know that that interference represents wind, the distraction and the loud trains that were entering the station. In addition, you're gonna see some of the challenges that I had um, when wind would come by. And all of these elements created some very similar conditions to playing in the subways. So I have a short little video. First, you're going to ride the CTA train into the station, and then there will be the two pieces on different videos. Um, at this time, if you still need to get some coloring or writing supplies, please do so quickly in the next 30 seconds while you're riding the train. And you get off the train and this is what you see.
All right, so finish up your drawing. And then let's say you entered the subway with me on a different day. And this would be a different piece that you might hear.
So that was the experience and uh, that hundreds of people had. And they had the opportunity if they wanted to participate and add some artwork. So in the subway, there were four trends kind of regarding people's responses. First, some pe many people showed a lack of interest. They just gazed down, they walked faster, or they just kind of ignored the experience and were in whatever they were doing. However, there were many people who didn't draw that smiled and nodded and stopped to listen. And so this was a way to pull some people out of whatever they were doing in their normal day. And they had some curiosity about the experience. The next thing, um, it often took at least 10 to 15 minutes of playing each day before the first person would add their artistic expression. However, once one person drew or wrote, more people started coming quickly to participate, which suggests that people needed an example or encouragement, permission, or some guidance when trying a new way of engaging with music. Third, I can't count the number of times I saw people being hesitant and saying, I just can't color. And finally, people who participated all had positive reactions. And sometimes they shared that toward me or I could observe that with others that they shared. And uh, many said that they didn't realize they liked flute music or classical music. So we're th there were three there were three stories that represent many of my interactions with people. Um, and this, they highlight the people's enjoyment, the self perceptions of their own art skills and the importance of social interact in, interaction in this performance setting. So on day one, the first participant who participated said, this seems like a fun experiment, but some people have bad art experiences as children. And this is a lovely idea, but I don't know if they're gonna color. Thankfully, people did end up coloring. On day two, two people came and were discussing what to draw. And the woman was encouraging the man to add to the poster, but he seemed very hesitant. And he said, I don't know, my art, skill, my art skills are horrible, but she still encouraged him and he ended up drawing. On the fourth day, two women approached, one immediately decided to color. And I invited the other, but she said, I'm not creative and can't come up with pictures. I explained that it doesn't have to be a full picture or it could be words and whatever you experience is valid. And while I kept playing a sonata, she ended up drawing birds. And then she wrote birds in purple, added the three squiggles underneath and smiled before leaving. And you can see that on this poster that's circled in black. And what's great is on pack, when I was packing up on day four, I spoke with a public transit worker who had watched the entire day of interactions. And we talked about all the expressions and how they represent the experience of each person. And this transit worker summed up the courage and value of each person's artistic expression with, they put their mark. So now I'm curious, what was your mark? And as you can see, here are, the, here are the many marks of the different people that I interacted with. There's a variety of written, colored, and drawn expressions. And there's a complete picture, there are complete pictures done by individuals and others that people added onto. But most importantly, these are signs of being a collaborative listener. Participants were able to identify and express their experience or connection with the music in that moment. And so take a moment to reflect, how do these expressions compare to yours? There's no right or wrong answer. Your experience is valid. And was it similar, different, somewhat similar? Was it based on an emotion, a memory, something you created or imagined or something else entirely? So as we're starting to wrap up, here's just a few themes that showed up in my, in my analysis. A listener can engage with music, especially classical music, without any historical or theoretical knowledge. And sometimes they just need the guidance or freedom to interpret the music. 
art and writing activities can promote this musical connection for listeners, as long as we can get over the hesitancy that, oh, maybe I don't feel like I can do it. I can't draw. But yes, in fact, you can draw, you can write words, whatever comes is okay. And finally, artistic expression um, of musical experiences can be a gateway for social connection. Um, it gives you a chance to share your experience with others and also learn about others' experiences. And so there's still a lot of research to be done on how we as listeners experience music, but this subway experiment adds to that knowledge about what listeners are thinking, feeling, or might be experiencing while listening. So my final takeaway for you is to consider these three ideas the next time you listen to music. Continue exploring your connection to music as a listener be open to your first reaction and see where does the music and creativity take you. If you're unsure or want to try some new way of connecting, you can always ask yourself questions. What character do I hear? What color would I put with this piece? Or whatever might inspire you that's in the music. And finally, share your experience with others and ask them about their connection with music. It's some, music is something that people all over the world participate in, so it's clearly meaningful to us as people. And it's a wonderful opportunity to learn about and connect with others. And when we become collaborative listeners, we're present to expression, creativity, and connection with others and ourselves. So this is the end of my presentation, and I just want to give a special thank you to Roxanne and the MSU Science Festival for this opportunity to share this experiment and demonstration with you. Um, check out other events that they're doing throughout the month. And uh, thanks for listening. And at this point, um, I invite any questions or comments. Yes, so if you're on Zoom, you can type your questions into the Q&A section. And if you're on Facebook Live, you can type your question in the comment section, or you can just write if you want, what the music made you feel or what color you thought it might be, I'd be curious to know what our listeners are, are seeing out there. Yeah, and you know what? I'll just share mine because I like to do this every time. For the first piece, I just imagined a little sunny day, peaceful day, just walking around. I'm a big fan of stick figures, let me tell you that, so... I'm so happy to see that because in my... I didn't draw anything, but in my head, I was in this lush, green, beautiful, like Eden garden. And I just oh. felt so at peace and joyful. And I was like, I can't draw it, but I certainly can see it in my head. So oh, I love like, it. yeah, it looks like we do have a couple of questions here. Um, oh, okay. So Annette says for the first one, she saw floating clouds and flowers. And for the second one, she drew hummingbirds. Oh, lovely. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scroll back if, if I can, and we can pull up there. So that way, as people are sharing theirs, if they want to see as well. So I do see a bird theme that people saw birds. I'm an avid birder myself, and I, I, yeah. I like that image. Um, and I'm wondering if, um, do you always use classical music? when you're doing your pieces? That's a great question. Yeah, so um, since I, I am a trained classical flutist, um, all my research has been based on Western classical music, um, but I do have future projects and ideas that this type of connection that we have actually is beyond any specific genre, and it's more of how do we just engage with music in general. Yeah. So. I know there are certain songs that you grow up with that it takes you right back to where you were, you know, when you were 12 or 15 or, and I'm wondering, have people studied that? It's you're sort of making those mental images, I guess, as you're listening to music. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think I'm seeing another. Yep, I was just going to pull that up. Have you compared your research to work of Abigail Housen? I'm not sure that I'm saying that correctly. And Philip Yanoe in visual thinking strategies. Can we get your contact info? Ooh. Oh, and there's your contact info. Yep. 
So awesome. yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Brandon, for that. Um, I, I'm not familiar with Abigail House Center, Philip Yenoe. Um, I just typed their names though. I really appreciate you sharing that. Cause, um, I, I'd be curious to know, yeah, what they have to say as well. One thing, um, I'm curious, uh, actually, what uh, discipline they're in, because a lot of my research is uh, interdisciplinary, and I actually pull a lot from psychologists um, and uh, music education research as well. And so uh, it's really helpful to, to get names of various, um, various researchers. And do you think you would get the same responses with a different instrument other than a flute? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I think, so I'm doing my current um, doctoral research on a, a larger study with 40 people who are going through four listening sessions. And then I'm doing um, two rounds of interviews with them and it's all solo flute music, mainly because we're in a pandemic. <laughs> um, but what I'm noticing is that some people do say like they have different relationships with different instruments. And so you're, that will trigger different um, memory or nostalgic responses sometimes. Um, but sometimes uh, it really is the piece itself or it's the combination of the piece and the instrument um, and what's interesting is you can listen to the same piece multiple times at different points, and you will also sometimes have a very different response. And so it's not, it's very, um, it's all based like in the moment kind of, and what does your life experience up to that moment? Awesome. And then Annette says that they use visual thinking is something that we do in schools. So is that, um, secondary schools, elementary schools, middle schools. I'm curious yeah. to know what age. I would think this would be awesome for elementary kids because they're so much freer with their expressions. They, they're, they don't have the hangups of, am I doing it right? Yeah, so what's interesting about that, so I, I've done these for a couple of um, elementary classes as young as um, kindergarten. And they, they have a great time. They, we gave them paint, they had a blast. Yeah. Um, but what I, what I really like about working with adults as well or older students is they have more vocabulary and they have more um, memory to actually pull from. And so the, the way that they connect, um, and sometimes they may have you know, more um, skill sometimes in terms of what they can do with their hands. Um, so that can be sometimes an even deeper experience. So I, I would definitely encourage it as we're getting, uh, as, as people get older, I encourage you to like keep tapping into how your connection changes because it actually might have more layers to it. Um, but we, but I think you're right, Roxanne, like we start to tell ourselves or, or society tells us at some point, like I'm no longer creative. Mm -hmm. So I can't do this or I'm not skilled enough. And I'm trying to kind of combat that and remind people that um, as adults, like we are just as creative, if not sometimes more because we have so much more to pull from. Right, right. Oh, and Annette said she uses it with um, first through sixth grade. So that's interesting, the visual thinking. Oh, great. Thank you, Annette. That's really helpful. Well, I think unfortunately we are out of time. I really enjoyed this. Um, and when COVID is over, do you plan to go back to Chicago? I guess before we let you go. Um, so I have one more year of my doctorate. Um, and then, uh, and if anyone is interested in hearing my lecture recital, um, that will be in spring 2022. So feel free to shoot me an email and I can keep you on that email list. Um, and then once I graduate, hopefully, you know, there will be a professor position out there for me. Um, otherwise, I'll probably move to some larger city and uh, kind of start teaching and performing again. Um, my email is uh, br, b as in boy, r-i-n-k-m-37 
at msu.edu. Can I don't know if it's able to be seen on the screen or not. Yeah, it's visual there. Okay. Yeah. And then Brandon also um, had a comment. He drew squiggles and waves as he listened and wrote like a butterfly fluttering, sitting still, then taking flight, circling round, flutter flute, flutter skip, dance, flip, flutter, flap, flap, flutter away. Oh, I love that. Wow. Yes, the researchers are from BTS Visual Thinking Strategies and it's used with all agents. And I'm studying this now also, aesthetic arts education, mm -hmm. Lincoln Car for the Arts. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I love the mashup of art and science and music. And I just, we need each other. We all come at problems looking for answers in different ways by observing and testing and trying things. And um, I was so happy that to see we have some music with the festival this year. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I was so <laughs> excited to see that it was a STEAM festival. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm trying to change the name, but that's since we've been around as the science festival for nine years, people know us as that, but we say we're not just science, we're STEAM, so. Right. All right, well, um, this is the end of this presentation. We have one more on the stock market tonight at 810. So if you wanna learn some stock market ideas and what to look for, that's tonight. Um, you can find the link on the Science Festival page. And then we still have many more talks throughout the month of April and we have a big expo day on Saturday. So check us out at sciencefestival.msu.edu. Thanks again, James, for joining us tonight. I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you all and take care and happy creating. <laughs> <laughs> good night. All right, good night.